The media these days is full of stories about a new demographic group, or at least a newly discovered demographic group, the spiritual but not religious a subset of another demographic group that's getting a lot of attention, the religious nuns, that is to say, N-O-N-E-S. <laughs> Those are the people who tell researchers that they don't identify with any religious tradition. Both of these groups have been increasing rapidly in numbers for the past 70 years, with each successive generation including a larger, larger percentage of people who just don't do church, synagogue, mosque, ashram, etc. This phenomenon is of major concern to uh, congregations, of course, and many once strong congregations and denominations have gone into decline, including evangelical Christian groups. We UUs have done better than most groups that don't have a very high birth rate, like the Mormons, but we can't really say we've done very well. One of my extracurricular activities this spring has been delivering a couple of lectures on this subject to UUs around the country, and that's gotten to me to wonder about the most interesting to me of these social phenomenon, which is the spiritual but not religious. What people mean when they say that they are spiritual not, but not religious is that they are interested in personal enlightenment, peace of mind, service to the world, and religious learning, but they are suspicious of religious institutions and don't care to participate in them. They give a number of reasons for this, beginning with not believing what they think established religions teach, but it's mostly focused on how religious institutions and leaders can be hypocritical, inwardly focused, self-protective, and political. So if we drew a picture of spiritual but not religious, it might look like this. <laughs> PowerPoint light. <laughs> now there are a lot of ways that Unitarian Universalism is spiritual but not religious friendly. We share a lot of social values with this group of people. We don't insist that anybody believe any particular thing. We try really hard to avoid hypocrisy, inward focus, or activities like tolerating abusive clergy that would require us to later be self-protective. And we try to run our institutions in an open, democratic, transparent way. However, there is no getting around it. We are a religion. And we are in particular danger of falling into a real hole here that of being religious but not spiritual, which is to say, of busying ourselves with the institution and the trappings of religion and neglecting to pay any real attention to spirituality, and that looks like this. <laughs> now, all religious institutions can get to here, but we're particularly prone because lacking shared beliefs and doctrines, we can get rather shy about exploring spirituality. It can get relegated to the personal realm. Okay to meditate in the privacy of your own house, but just don't talk about it here. Now, actually, religious but not spiritual was a good gig for us in the 20th century, when enough people wanted freedom from particular beliefs, but felt the cultural expectation that they belonged to some congregation. They came to us, many of you came to us uh, in that way. But those cultural expectations have been shattered. There are very few places in this nation where a person would feel completely out of place if they didn't belong to a congregation these days. So we can't be spiritual but not religious because we're religious. And we have to avoid religious not, but not spiritual because after all, what's the point? We have to turn to something else and what I want to suggest is spiritual, but not dogmatic. <laughs> now that word spiritual is one some you use love to hate. They don't know what it means and it sounds a little like spiritualism and it gets mixed up with religiosity. So let's start with a few definitions. The spiritual dimension of life is the depth dimension of life. Spirituality is paying attention to the depth dimension of life. This is the part of life where meaning comes from, where the why questions are asked, where love lives. If we're looking for God, we go in that direction. 
but we also go there looking for peace, for self-acceptance, for our place in the universe. We look there for a sense of connection, for compassion, for the strength to live up to our moral values. There's a depth of life available for every human being and a spirituality and a spiritual practice to fit every kind of belief about the meaning of life. Spiritual practice is intentionally cultivating the depth dimension of life, the doing on purpose of the cultivating of the depth dimension of life. Becoming aware of and using the states of mind and heart will help you find depth of meaning, love, and purpose. The human race has come up with a myriad of social practice, so spiritual practices because people are different. We symbolize spirituality just now by the meditating woman sitting in a posture that frankly would kill most of us. <laughs> but it's just a symbol. There's spiritual practices of meditating in chairs, serving others, learning, moving your body, writing, even speaking. If you think you don't have a spiritual practice, well, think again. You're here. For most of you here, you've either decided or in, in process of deciding to make a spiritual practice of attending a worship service because you hope it will deepen your life, teach you something new, be an experience of peace and renewal, right? Spirituality is not spiritualism, communication with the dead. Like Mary with an A means to wed and Mary with an E means to be happy, these words spirituality and spiritualism are sort of related, but they simply do not mean the same thing. Spirituality is also not piety, a word which describes, usually with a tint of disapproval, a life which is completely focused on devotion and duty to God. Piety is one kind of spirituality, but it's not the only kind. Religiosity is yet another word with a negative cast. It describes a piety and a religious zeal which is either faked or the product of mental unwellness. Lots of misunderstandings about this word, no doubt about that. And you might ask why we have to look, use it at all, and the answer is twofold. First of all, there's no other word which encompasses the depth that we're talking about broadly enough to cover the expansive freedom we offer in Unitarian Universalism. The second reason is that that's the word the culture is using. And if we refuse to use it, it would only isolate us. And frankly, that's a luxury we can't afford in these days of ever enlarging nuns. Instead, we're going to define it our way, expansively and inclusively, which is the way we are. Alain de Dupont is a, a, an atheist. He has no use whatsoever for the supernatural, as it's explained by religions. However, he has a certain appreciation for the unintended consequences of religion, and he worries that without religious institutions, the civitas will be poorer and people less wise. He wrote a book called Religion for Atheists, and in it he has an interesting comment about the fruits of spirituality. He writes, we invented religion to serve two central needs which continue to this day and which secular society has not been able to solve with any particular skill. First, the need to live together in communities in harmony despite our deeply rooted selfish and violent impulses. And secondly, the need to cope with terrifying degrees of pain which arise from our vulnerability to professional failure, troubled relationships, the death of loved ones, and our own decay and demise. So what kind of spiritual practices and observances actually help us with pain, vulnerability, grief, and our knowledge that we will die? What kind of practices enable us to live peacefully with others and keep a rein on our selfish or angry impulses? Perhaps de Botton didn't mention developing peace of mind because he knows that there are a variety of secular philosophies which encourage this, often using techniques which are strikingly like meditation and owe an awful lot to the careful study of humanities over centuries by the Buddhists. Anyway, if we want to live well and live deeply, what should we do and how can religious but not dogmatic institution help? 
Well, with no dogma, we are free to honor the religions of the world in all their glorious diversity, as well as the spiritual quest and spiritual practices which come to us from philosophy, humanism, and atheism. We're also free to honor the ways that people are different and the fact, well known to most religions, that different spiritual practices appeal to different kind of people. Most of the world's larger faiths recognize that people are different, have different gifts, and experience the holy or express their spirituality in different ways and need different practices. There are different kinds of yoga in Hinduism, different gifts of the spirit in Christianity, Catholic religious orders for those whose call is to serve the people and for those whose call is to pray without ceasing. In the end, most of these schemes are variations on a general scheme of four spiritual paths, the path of the mind, the path of the heart, the path of mysticism, and the path of service. For most you use, the most congenial task of spiritual development is the formation of beliefs that we find comforting and challenging as we live our lives. Everybody does it. Even people who say they believe nothing actually have lots of beliefs. They believe that there is no life afterlife, that this life is all we have. They believe that we humans are on our own in the universe, that there is no divine force or love of love or morality. We all have to work these beliefs out for ourselves. We all have beliefs and live our lives by precepts, which we cannot prove. The development of a belief system is the practice of the intellect. We read, we discuss, we hear what others have to say, and we puzzle out what of that makes sense to us. In a spiritual but not dogmatic church, we honor this spiritual path of the mind, and we don't fence it around with things that you have to believe. Angela's sermon on reincarnation last week was a good example of that kind of spiritual practice. If that's, your pra if that's your path, you might enjoy the subversive Bible study class that's about to start, or the UU Humanists group's ongoing discussions. Secondly, there are spiritual paths of the heart, paths which help us to develop compassion. The Buddhists have this wonderful guided meditation that we sometimes do to this end. Every week in the service, we bring to mind those who are hurting in some way and name, the them, name them aloud or in our hearts. Some sermons and forums aim to teach us about the plight of other beings, including animal beings, including the planet, so that our heart can be softened to others and their plight. Covenant groups are our main program for helping us explore the path of the heart, and they offer a unique kind of open-hearted listening which helps us to be compassionate to others and to ourselves. If you're interested in this, make time in your life for these bi-weekly groups which begin in October each year and last for seven months. Thirdly, the path of mysticism, the road not taken very often by you youth, but we do have our mystics. If you resonate with Brian Taylor's reading about how everyone is contemplative, if you can fall into a sense of awe and unity, stroking your dog or hiking in a beautiful landscape or gazing at a baby, then you have at least a little mystical bone in your body that you could develop. These times of insight and unity are usually quite brief, but they shimmer in the stories of our lives. These experiences sometimes change what we believe, which sends us back to the path of the intellect. They often open our hearts, which sends us back to the uh, hope, practices of open-heartedness. Mystics are a suspect class, though, in most dogmatic traditions, because the truth that, truths that come to people in such experiences are so powerful, and they so often go against dogma, that this causes trouble, but not here. Some people are motivated to do what it takes to have these experiences more often. Learning the skills of meditation that help us quiet our minds helps, but these experiences seem to be mostly gifts rather than achievements. They come in their own sweet way, and mostly our task is to remember them, which is surprisingly hard, and cherish them. Finally, the time-honored path of service which is another way of developing and expressing compassion 
and connection with the world. Whether you've developed the spiritual discipline of emptying your coin purse into the offering plate every week, no matter how many quarters there are, <laughs> or teaching RE, or tutoring neighborhood children, or bringing canned goods for the food pantry, or volunteering even in the political realm, service to others to make the world a better place is a spirituality which stretches us, teaches us, and sometimes even offers us that wonderful experience of oneness. We have an abundance of ways you can get involved in these kinds of projects. This kind of spirituality is the kind that Unitarian Universalism has most fully developed. But we're not the only ones. Hafiz, the medieval Islamic poet, wrote about this classic encounter between the path of mysticism and the path of service in one of his poems. He writes, once a man came to me and spoke for hours about his great visions of God he felt he was having. He asked me for confirmation, saying, are these wondrous dreams true? I replied, how many goats do you have? He looked surprised and said, I am speaking of sublime visions, and all you ask is about goats? And I spoke again, saying, yes, brother, how many do you have? Well, Hafiz, I have 62. And how many wives? Again, he looked surprised and said, four. How many rose bushes in your garden? How many children? Are your parents still alive? Do you feed the birds in winter? And to all he answered. And then I said, you asked me if I thought your visions were true. I would say that they were, if they made you become more human more kind to every creature and plant that you know. The things that religions offer, worship, discussions, learning opportunities, service projects, meditation classes, all these in the end are but one ingredient of your spirituality. The other ingredient you add yourself in the solitary practices of meditation, journaling, therapy, prayer, spiritual exercises, which promote self-understanding and self-acceptance. One criticism of the spiritual but not religious life is that it is often short on that first ingredient, that shared aspect of spirituality, which not only gives new input, but gives us a chance to get feedback about what we are doing and thinking. I think this criticism neglects the possibilities that the institution of religion is not the only kind of community in the world. But institutions of religion have especially developed in human culture to tend to the spiritual part of life and solo practitioners have to work hard to find good substitutes. We you use embedded as we are in a religion sometimes to tend to neglect the solo work so I urge you to walk in the desert sit in the morning with your coffee and do that loving kindness meditation or empty your thoughts or just watch the birds do your yoga not just because it's good for your body, but because it can quiet your mind. And if yoga seems too strenuous or you feel too inflexible, Tai Chi is the practice of choice for millions of Chinese people for very good reason. Just church is probably not enough for the well-developed spiritual life. So keep experimenting until you find a balance that works for you. And rest assured that whatever you find that works for you is okay with us. No dogma, just a variety of paths to peace, self-acceptance, compassion, service, and oneness. Blessed be.